computer. There we go. Okay, we have a recording in progress. Very exciting. So welcome, everyone. It's great to see you. Um, we are this evening going to have the opportunity to discuss the book, but really kind of the ideas and issues and subjects connected to Killing a King, which was written by Dan Efron many years ago. The subtitle of the book, because every good book needs a title and then colon whatever, um, is The Assassination of Yitzhak Rabin and the Remaking of Israel. What's behind me, aside from beautiful palm trees or whatever trees those are, olive trees and other trees that are there, is this is now what's called in Hebrew Kikar Rabin, Rabin Square. It was not called that prior to this, uh, the events that took place in the book. Um, but literally behind me is on top of like over here is where Rabin was speaking from, walked down to go onto the street over here. And that's where his life was taken from him by Yigal Amir, as those of us who know the story or read the book or some combination of both. Um, as a reminder, Yigal Amir, Jewish, Israeli, um, spent his entire life, basically speaking, in Israel, did not grow up somewhere else, did had not have a uh, another religious background of any kind. So part of what is very interesting about this story is we often talk about the idea or think about the idea of, for lack of a better term, terrorism against Jewish people from the non-Jewish world, especially in Israel. But in this case, it was from within, right? And it should be noted that that is not totally uncommon. Um, and that in Israel, one of the challenges, let's take outside of what is currently happening as we are um, recording this in 2024, you know, just uh, several months after October 7th of 2023, but historically in Israel, there have been challenges between different communities in Israel. Sometimes those challenges are less or more, or depending on where people live, as you read in the book, or for those who know a little bit of the story, Yigal Amir himself and his family grew up in a neighborhood and lived in a neighborhood where you or I would have lived, even though his family was of, um, you know, a more orthodox bent. And it meant for many of us, we may know neighborhoods for those just by show of hands within the last, let's say, 15 years, who in this Zoom has been to Jerusalem or been to Israel. You know, okay. Right. So I will just say that many of us know a neighborhood like Mea Sharim in Jerusalem, which has been there forever. But Mea Sharim is a what some would call ultra orthodox neighborhood, certainly at the very least traditional neighborhood. And if you go there, the entire neighborhood is <clears throat> traditional. Yigal Amir did not grow up in that kind of neighborhood, as you learned about in the book, that he grew up in a neighborhood, even though he himself and his family were traditional, although his mom snuck in the TV, as you kind of, uh, for those who know a little bit about him. Um, but he was going to many schools and in, to a university that, although had a certain bent to it, would be considered a not ultra-religious schools or universities and he knew people in the neighborhood who were not of that background so <clears throat> sometimes we think also of things happening when your world is insular but in this case it was not his world was very worldly right and uh so it kind of debunked what happened here debunked everything that had mm -hmm. happened in israel before it also talks about some very important issues that we'll get to in um just a little bit, okay, um, that I'm happy to discuss and I think are very important, especially in light of what's happening in Israel today. But I'd love to start just by getting either from you some thoughts about, doesn't have to be at the about the book in particular, but either something that you may have read in the book or something you know about the story or anything that you've been thinking about for the last X number of years, you know, since Rabin was assassinated or anything that's come out of that, or just kind of general reflection. So I want to make sure Anyone can share what they would like, but just kind of how your general reactions to everything regarding the situation. Does anybody have anything they would like to share? If not, I'll jump right in. Well, I, mean, I think it's horrendous what's going on in in, in Israel. You know, You're saying now. Right now. And the upheaval that the death of Rabin uh, occurred when that happened. I mean, it, it fractured a lot of the political alliances, you know, that were in occurring in Israel at that time. And actually, 
the rise uh, in extent of the rise that Netanyahu should sure. be, uh, you know, associated with right. this he, assassination. He was definitely in this involved in the story here and has been involved in Israeli politics and life for many years now. What I do think is interesting, as you pointed out, Andy, is that, you know, um, I mean, I had friends who were there that day um, when it happened. And in speaking with them and in talking to others, you know, Israelis and others who have, you know, kind of lived through this, there has always been kind of a political divide, right? I mean, I, I joke about this, but it, what I'm going to say here is true. If you think American politics are crazy, it does not hold a candle to Israeli politics. And one of the things that you read about in the book or know of the situation or even in 2024 is that there has never been a time, I believe never been a time, in Israeli history where a single political party has had a majority in Knesset, in the government. And so all of these governments have had to make, in order to make a coalition, have had to make deals with smaller parties um, that were, you know, given perhaps one would argue additional or larger than their numbers power because of the need to create a coalition. So you saw that in the story of Rabin, of course, and how he was trying to deal with that, with dealing with the settler faction, which is smaller or larger now, smaller than, okay? Um, and how all of that is kind of played into today's politics, right? Um, for Obviously, we are all very, very aware of what happened in Gaza on October, or from Gaza on October 7th. It is equally fair to say that one of the real challenges now for Israel and for um many like myself who love Israel very much, is you have members of the current government for whom, not in Gaza, but in the West Bank, their, to use the term, their not only support, but theological belief that Israel Israelis should be there and live there and it's their land and only their land, they are now in the government at a much higher rate, which was also mentioned in the book, it was kind of a small faction at the time, it's still a much higher rate. And so that is something that to this day poses a real challenge. How do you build the government, right? One of the things that was in the book, just to touch on a particular area, that was a big deal, less of a big deal then, but much more of a big deal that's happened over the last, pick whatever you want, 10, 15, 20 years, is the educational system in Israel right? Um, they don't have secretary of, they have minister of, right? No secretary mm -hmm. of defense, secretary of whatever. The minister, the ministry of education over the years has become one of the areas that those in the Haredi world who you, Yigal Amir was amongst the Haredi uh, community, um, ultra-Orthodox, whatever you might want to call them. The That is one of the ministries that they want to get when they often try to form a coalition with the government and then direct a lot of the educational money to the schools in that world. Right. And so you have these challenges of, you know, certain schools or certain types of education getting a greater emphasis. But you saw that in the, in the story of Yigal Amir as well. He was influenced in a significant way by teachers in his schools and certainly by rabbis along the way. Okay. And uh, all right, so I'm going to come back to that in a little bit. But um, any other initial thoughts from people? You can share whatever you want or questions. It doesn't matter. So I. Yeah, John. Sorry, Andrea, you go first. No, 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 no. You, John. You. You raised your hand. You no, were it's right. okay. Go, go ahead, please. Andrew. I was so quickly, I was just surprised about often there are assassinations and it drives folks to, to come together. Mm -hmm. And this drove things apart. Mm -hmm. And I think here what we have, and this is one of the bigger topics we'll talk about along the way, is when you believe, as Yigal and his brother believed, Haggai believed, that what they were doing was not just good or, you know, necessary, but literally the will of God, yeah. right? it takes on a different purpose. And so for what, John, what you're talking about, and um, for any of us who have been to Israel and have had the chance, or uh, I don't know the right word, to go to any of the, I'll put this in quotes, the settlements, okay? 
you will find people who are there for a variety of reasons. But for some of them, including those who are tend to be at the furthest outposts of the settler world, they are there because they believe God wants them to be there. And so that is one of the big divides, as you said, John, kind of that drove people apart. You have people who are saying, listen, we just want to live in peace and let them have this and we'll have that. And you had other people say, but wait, that's not what God wants. And we are not, we are doing what God wants us to do. And unfortunately, I think um, even though people know I have a particular view and a particular way of looking at Israel, I, I am very critical of the settler movement. And I think that it is doing no help to the future of Israel. I will say, and now I'm going to un- um, on whatever background my screen here. And then I promise I'll get you in a second. Um, we'll start John. There is an amazing book. It's a novel, highly recommend called the Hilltop by Asaf Gavron. I can put this in the notes. This is a novel. It's a hundred percent a novel, but it is about a settlement and what it is like there and kind of the, the reasons people come to a settlement and the way in which they handle themselves and the way in which they, um, in certain ways interact with the Arab population and in other ways do not. It should also be noted that in particular, one of the other issues that comes up um, many times in the world of, um, in this world, whatever you want to say, is there are also people, and John, you mentioned this, the idea of I am at a place for a religious reason as compared to a any other reason. But I will just share one of the things that has happened over the years. There are places that began as what might be called settlements, including one of the largest in Israel called Efrat, where you may know people who live. Mm-hmm. Okay, Efrat didn't start as a religious settlement. Efrat started as a, I want to live close to Jerusalem, And it's ridiculously expensive to live here. So we're going to build, the government built a road, right? And you and I and anybody, most people who live in Efrat are are not Israelis. I mean, they didn't grow up there, okay? But the challenge has become, it's so expensive to live in Israel, right? Tel Aviv, just to give you a city for an example, Tel Aviv in the world is usually the second or third most expensive city to live in in the world, okay? With real estate and, I mean, Andy, I'm sure you can give us all the numbers on that kind of stuff. But there is a, there is really this desire among some people to live in a less expensive place. And okay, it's not about religion for me. It's literally, it's a great neighborhood that I would want to raise my kids and send my kids to the school there. And I work in Jerusalem and it's a 15 minute ride instead of 45 it's, minutes from it, somewhere else. It's affordability. This right. is what you're saying. Right, correct. I, I, I do have a question. If I sure, can, and then I John, can break. Or then Andrea, we'll get to you for sure. Okay, um, you know my question is, you know the the assassin, uh-huh. you know who was a, you know a, a zealot on it from his perspective. Sure. Um, based to, based his, how do I say it? Based his influence, based his motivation, you know, on a very narrow Talmudic, you know, rule. Mm-hmm. You know, I did not read the book. I, I read That's the okay. Cliff Notes. Okay. Uh, you, you know, but I, my question is, you know, these narrow interpretations, mm-hmm. you know, you know, why would it act as such a trigger for an individual if he wasn't supported by his particular congregation or, you know, fellow students at the time? Right. You know, why did why did it fan it to such a point? <clears throat> that he felt that he needed to assassinate. So let, let's start with the concept first. It's one that we know particular. We know the word particularly well. The concept of the Rodef, the pursuer, okay? It's in a million synagogue names we know, Rodef Shalom and all the other ones right. that we think of, okay? Rodef just means to per- pursue, and in case of Rodef Shalom, to pursue peace, very nice. But let me talk about two issues in which the Rodef plays a the idea of Rodef plays a controversial, depending on what side of an issue you're on, one of which relates directly to this situation, which I'll talk about second, and then the first one, which is the issue of 
um, abortion in Jewish law. Okay. I'm going to use terms that I feel comfortable with, and then you can kind of, you know, use whichever ones you feel comfortable with. When a woman is pregnant, the being that is inside of her from Jewish law is considered to be part of her body, like her arm, leg, pick whatever else you want. The Rodef concept comes in if it is known that the, whatever you want to say, the being is going to harm the mother's life and or kill her, right, during birth or along the way or whatever it might be. Not only is it, according to Jewish law, not only is it okay to end the pregnancy, it is actually required to do so, right? You, it would be the equivalent of cutting off your arm to save yourself if you fell down a well and you could somehow get out if you cut off your arm, okay? However, at any moment when one hair, one finger, whatever of that child protrudes from the mom's body, then you can't choose between one life or another. So that often, because the idea of Rodef often is brought up in, you know, um, the pro-choice, pro-life debate in Israel, to use a term. The other one deals with what we're talking about here. The example the rabbis give in the Talmud uh, that's most commonly cited is a person is running down the street. There is a second person running after them saying, I am going to kill you. And they have a weapon. Okay, You are the third person who witnesses this. And then, according to the rabbis, that second person who's chasing is the rodef, the pursuer. It is your responsibility as the third person to do everything to stop the second person from doing that, okay? Including as a last resort, killing them. It's always a last resort, okay? As Andy mentioned, that idea of pursuing a person in, a, in the context of where Yigal Amir was growing up and in that world that still currently exists, depending on where you go and who you talk to, is that Rabin and others like Rabin were pursuing, were the Rodef, pursuing <clears throat> the death, so to speak, of Israel, the destruction of Israel. So the idea of transferring the concept of killing somebody onto killing something. Mm. And so he, was a, he was the third person. Right, he was the third person. And you have every, in his mind, I'm giving you obviously his worldview, in his mind, you have every right in the world to make sure that doesn't happen, including killing somebody, right? And therefore, in that, in their, in the mindset of the ro the narrow view as you're talking about, you are pursuing, you are ending the pursuer's pursuit, right? And you're doing it to make sure he cannot do what he seeks to do. Now, nowhere in the Talmud does it say, you know, if someone is going to sign a peace treaty with whoever, because it didn't exist back then. There weren't the countries the way they were now. Um, so it is a little bit of a transfer of from a person to a thing, right, to a place, from a person being pursued to a um, individual being pursued, but when we are to a state being pursued. But when we tie two things together, the first we just talked about, and the second is this, which you may or may not know. And actually, someone just brought this up to me the other day, and they didn't believe it was true, but it is true. There are many in the traditional Jewish world, not many, en enough, in the traditional Jewish world, who believe that Israel currently should not exist. Mm. Not because it's some bad place or evil, but because the Messiah has yet to come. And only when the Messiah comes, okay, now we're going to go back to the idea of giving birth to a child for a minute here. There is the idea in Judaism that there could be one person one day who comes great. There is another idea, which is very, very strong in rabbinic literature, depending on where you read, that says we as individuals or as communities can help bring upon the term that's used by the rabbis are the birth pangs of the messiah we can help to move it forward and so you also had a situation where yigalamir is hearing these kind of things right you as a, we as human beings don't just wait for god we do it right 
And you remember that story in the book, for those who read it, he was one, before he assassinated Rabin, well before he assassinated Rabin, he was in a room with him and he had a gun with him. And he said, you know, was this the right moment? Did I, he didn't do it then, obviously. Did I miss my chance, right? Because he believed God was putting him in certain places and asking him to do certain things, right? So this was also him helping to, in his mind, obviously, to accelerate what God wanted to happen. And so, Andy, I think part of what the, the answer to your question is, obviously, before social media and all the other things that were kind of ascendant now, is when you're hearing from your teachers, from your rabbis, I mean, it's from whoever, this is what God wants you to do. It can be a very powerful push for people. And I think that's what happened with him, right? It was, he was bringing upon or helping to bring forward what was always destined to be in his mind from God. Andrea. Um, well, just general thoughts, you know, your sure. initial question. Sure. Um, I, I thought I really was glad that you um, arranged this and that I read the book uh, because at the time that this happened, um, I was, other than the fact that I was in my 20s and, you know, less connected to less, less aware, certainly than 20 somethings today of what's going on in the world. I was also living in Hong Kong at the time oh, wow. um, and just very disconnected. And I remember when it happened, but um, but I, I didn't I wasn't clear, obviously, on all the details. And in my mind and then, of course, I never <clears throat> revisited, you know, delved into it and, and found out more information, you know, afterwards when I could have. And in my mind, I thought I knew it was a far right extremist um, Jewish person, but I thought that it was like some, in my mind, it was just some like super lone wolf, psycho right-wing fanatic person. Mm -hmm. And um, what, what I found so disturbing was that number one, that he was you know, he was a fairly sane individual from a loving sure. family. Sure. Um, and he was, you know, even though he took the the actual action on his own, there was an enormous community of people that felt exactly how he felt and that he was supported and pushed on by, I mean, the, the rabbis that agreed that, uh, that, you know, that Rabin was the Rodef and that, you know, he did deserve to die. And, um, and, and, you know, I was unaware of all of the, the anti peace, if you will, or anti compromise, uh, protests. And, um, it, it, it was very disturbing and it made me feel that, um, I don't see how there's ever going to be peace because how there ever could be peace, because there are too many, the, the only way it seems that it could be is if everyone agrees because once you have any factions and there are factions on both sides as he spoke about in the book um that want to you know and obviously we saw that you know hamas started attacks and that you know there was there was both sides um extremism on both sides that was sabotaging the process uh you're never going to make everybody be of the same mind, especially when there's, it's not like a one person thing. There's so many people that are against it on both sides that feel adamantly that, that they can't give up anything. It just, it, it made me so, um, so sad, so sure. depressed sure. to, to <laughs> realize that, that, you know what, there's, there's never going to be peace. No matter what happens, there's never going to be peace. Yeah, look, I think peace is a very lofty goal, period, right? And certainly a lofty goal there. Um, I will say, and I know this is being recorded, so it's not like a secret. I, and um, For me, people have asked me for a long time about the two-state solution. And I've always said to them, I don't believe in it. Not because I don't believe in it, but I don't believe it's feasible, right? And I certainly have a particular point of view in terms of why I don't think it's feasible, which I'd be happy uh, to share at any given time, but um, I would agree in general terms that there are challenges on both the Israeli side and the Palestinian, to use the term, side of the equation, 
and that there's people whose literal livelihood depends on it not, you know, not happening. Okay. And so I think even back in, not that it was so long ago, but even time of Rabin, you see it. And that's only intensified now, right? It's only intensified. And I would say what is totally true about what many of us have said is that if we were, if we were in Israel in the time of Yigal Amir, in the time of Yitzhak Rabin, in the time that we're talking about in this book, we would have sent our kids to Bar Alam University. It was not some crazy school that you wouldn't have sent your kids to. You know, it wasn't some Haredi, you know, right wingish. What there was a faction of those people, but there were people that were there taking math and science and whatever other classes would have been offered at the university. So I think one of the things that we can see is even in a time before, again, social media and all those kind of things, you can see how radicalization can happen, right? You can see how if you are taught something your whole life, it can in certain ways intensify, in other ways not intensify. You can also see how, just to use something else that's talked about in the book and was mentioned, you mentioned it, Andrea, the concept of what we think of a person or a person who could do such a thing, right? Or what we think of the general stereotype of group X, right? We think of, oh, the Orthodox don't serve in the military. He served in the military, right? He went and served in the military. His brother served in the military, right? Many Orthodox serve in the military. So there really is kind of this debunking of a lot of myths, which what is in many ways is at the core of what happened here. And I think in a way that is perhaps more than before and certainly even more than after, it really highlighted the divide within the Jewish world. And there is a very, um, uh, this, what I'm about to say here comes out of the Shoah, comes out of the Holocaust, but there is a well-known philosophical idea that is, you know, what's called the 614th commandment, okay? And so what is that 614th commandment? It's to not give Hitler a posthumous victory, right? And the idea behind it was we can't literally kill ourselves from within because that's what Hitler would have wanted, you know, what the Nazis would have wanted. But in the, you see that whether it's in America, Israel, anywhere along the way, anywhere in the world, wherever you say, you do see that sometimes there can be this internal fighting that is so strong that it almost overwhelms what really unites us more than divides us, right? And look, I'll share just one, one other quick thing. I'm going to um, also turn off my background again. And I don't want you to think I just read books that are, you know, somewhat uh, disturbing. But one of the best books I've ever read um, and this will get to a guy that's in the book, but not Yigal Amir, is this book, Terror in the Mind of God. I don't know if it's available anymore on the old Amazon, but this guy, Mark Jurgensmeyer, if you want to, this is not a pick-me-up book. I'm just letting you know in advance. He got access to interview people all over the world who have committed atrocities in the name of God. So Northern Ireland, in Japan, there was a guy who went in and, um, did all kinds of things in the subway system, including he would, he also had the chance to interview. I'm going to share my screen for a minute here. Um, he also had a chance, hopefully you can see this guy, to interview the people who supported Baruch Goldstein, who is pictured here. Baruch looks like a nice, peaceful gentleman. He was, of course, your doctor prior to what he did. Okay. But when you read in the book um, that I just mentioned, that terror in the mind of God, but you can see it in Killing the King, you, I'm sure, could go on the internet today and find people who view him as a hero, okay, as a hero, right? Because he, in their mind, did what he was destined to do by God. By the way, just to share another picture, this is Yigal Amir, right? He does not look like some crazy right-wing guy that came, you know, out of wherever. He looks like a normal guy walking down the street, okay? 
And so I just want us to say that like sometimes stereotypes can be real and stereotypes can be challenging. And we have to kind of rid ourselves of those, if we can, to the best of our ability of those stereotypes. So you, what, you're, what you're really saying is that we got a psychopath living next door and we don't know about him, you, it's him or her. No, I mean, look, I mean, how many times have we seen, um, you know, when God forbid has happened and they interview the neighbor and they go, he seemed like a nice guy. Oh. I never, yeah, I, you know. He was always a quiet guy. Yeah, he was. Yeah, right, right. So you scare me, John. <laughs> but I will say just a couple of things about uh, just general statements here. Okay. There's a couple of statements in the book, some a statement like this in the time prior around Oslo, the Oslo, of course, nothing divided Israelis more sharply than the settlement enterprise. So I need to tell you that in many ways that is still true. But it's not always for the reason that we think of most notably. It's mentioned in the book, what I'm going to tell you. But this is what is really challenging for people. If someone wants to go or a group of people want to go live in Gaza or the West Bank, many people in Israel will say, God bless you. Go and be well and have a nice life. I don't agree with you, but go and be well. However, if you want my son or daughter who's in the IDF, to be the policeman or so to speak, the, the army that's protecting your settlement. No. And that's what you saw like with, the, I mean, Burke Goldstein wasn't in a settlement, but whether it's settlement or Hebron or anything like that, there's this issue of, do we, the Israeli people militarily support the settlements, right? And for years to get back to the government side of things that has happened. Right where Israel's government has sent in not just one or two guys to sit at the front gate, but troops to make sure. And that has been something that has severely divided the Israeli people because it's their child now. It's their son or daughter or husband or wife or whoever it happens to be. So that is a big issue currently and will always be a big issue unless it um, should change for a certain reason. The other thing that is very true that still exists to this day is that, <clears throat> excuse me, Yigal Amir was of a certain background, right? Kind of that Yemenite background, okay? There is no question that within the Jewish world, there is, within the Israeli Jewish world and in the government and beyond, there is a true divide between people of different cultures, okay? It's very true even though they might eat each other's food and whatever it is there, you know, it used to be to use a term that has now become very popular. Um, let's say in the last 20 years, when, when people used to say, Oh, that's like an interfaith marriage that not didn't used to be like Jew and non-Jew. That used to be Ashkenazic Jew and Sephardic Jew, mm -hmm. right? Still Jews, but, you know, the concept, I am now this has changed, but and this is what I'm going to say is within the last couple of years, you know, you used to have people that would eat a ham sandwich and drive their car on Shabbat. But if they ate corn on Passover, that was like the end of their life, right? Because what Jew does that, except every Sephardic Jew in the world, right? Because that's what they've always done. Mm -hmm. And so there are these divides that still exist to this day. And yeah, Lindy, please. Oh, sorry, you got to unmute yourself uh, here. I'll ask no. you to unmute. Oh, am I unmuted? You are now. Oh, um, Eric, wouldn't you say it's a lot more than just the divide that, they, that they've that they been um, characteristically discriminated against? Correct, correct, correct. That's, and it, mean, depends, it depends on where, you know, that could be in the neighborhood, you know, the kids, like whatever, I would say like, it's not like gang warfare. I'm not using that kind of term, but, you know, I'm not going to play with that kid. You know, he's this, he's that, or I'm this and I'm that, you know, that kind of thing where, you know, if your daughter came home with that guy, that's a no, right? There's no way we're going to, now that's, that's lessened over the years, but it's also where it is intense. It's very intense. If that's right, we put it. Andy. Yeah. You know, also, I think you're, we're seeing it a, a dramatic influence of 
people who move to Israel from other countries. Yeah. And and what they are projecting as their biases on how Israel should behave and run this the state. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and they're trying to create it into an image that really may not have been what Israel was started with. You yeah. know, you know, it's and it's you know, diluting, I think, you know, the actual state of Israel from their original mission, you know, as a place of refuge, you know, for us uh, Jews. Yeah, for anyone who was being persecuted wherever or just needed a place to go, right? Was, right. Yeah, look, I, I think there is, um, there are real challenges in the, in Hebrew, the word dati, religious, and chiloni, the secular world. One of the reasons it's been a challenge for, there's no such thing as the reform movement, I'm putting that in quotes, in Israel. It's called progressive Judaism. So it's any non-Orthodox Judaism. But one of the challenges that's happened there over the years, and when you talk to many of us have had kids who go to overnight camp or, you know, we meet Israelis in our business life or whatever it happens to be. The idea of for many years was you were either Dati, you were either religious or Chiloni or secular. And in within Dati, within religion, there was the Haredi and there was the whatever, but you were either one or the other. The concept of being a progressive Jew was not something that was a thing, right? And to be totally fair, the re, you know, to just put an American overlay on something, whenever I take the kids to Israel and we go to a synagogue, I always say to them, what's not here that's it at Shirami, right? Because look, that synagogue's going to have a sanctuary too, right? And that's it. But what it doesn't have is a school, right? Because no synagogue needs a school. There's no religious school there. Because you just go to school where you learn Hebrew and you learn Israeli history. And so the idea of what a religious institution is in Israel is different than it is here, right? For many people, no judgment, for many people, they enter Shirami or another synagogue like their entry point is their kid's education, mm-hmm. right? Whereas in Israel, you wouldn't have that. It's why, by the way, it is very difficult for Israelis to understand that you have to, quote unquote, pay dues to belong to a synagogue because you don't have to do that in Israel. Bless you, John. It's funded by the state, right? Again, get yourself on the Ministry of Religion and you're in good shape, right? Don't get yourself on the Ministry of Religion and your synagogue is going to have to do some serious philanthropy. Like. Yeah, but it's but it's interesting your comment. You know, Herzog is rolling over in his grave sure. because Zionism was progressivism coming out of Germany that started Israel. Yeah, look, or, I would say I would say Zionism. If you look at Herzl's kind of view, his view was to have a the equivalent of Europe in what is now Israel, right? Culture, culture wise, and not in terms of language. Language he wanted Hebrew, but in terms of culture and sports and arts and right. And that was his view to have, because we couldn't live in France or Germany or wherever, depending on how things were going. So that has certainly changed now to be um, fair is the wrong word to be logical, logically, mathematically motivated. If you really think about it, okay. If you're in a traditional home, right. Traditional Jewish home and you have 10 kids who have 10 kids who have 10 kids who have 10 kids, your population is going to grow much faster than the secular family that has two kids that have three kids that have one kid that have two, you know, whatever it is. And so that's also very much what's happened, right? You've had a large growth. The two largest growing populations in Israel are the traditional Orthodox, what I'm going to call it, and the Arab world, the Arab population, which is the second problem for Israel, not problem, second conundrum, which is, okay, if Israel is going to be a Jewish state, which I would argue it should be, I hope we would all feel that way, what percentage of people need to be Jews? 58, 61, 50.1, 90, right? But eventually the Arab population will grow to be very significant. And do we, to use a term that's in the book, do we evacuate them from the area, right? I I don't think you can do that, right? Right. This was raised way before October 7th, raised like 10 years ago in the Knesset. There, so, there were already like 
a significant amount. Sure. Aren't they like 1.6 million of 9 million or something? Yeah, it's, like? it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 15 to 20% of the country. Okay. Actually, there are far, far, far less Christians living in Israel than there are Muslims, Arab Muslims. Okay. Way less. Um, now, one of the things, just to talk about something here for a minute, that has posed an additional challenge from the time of Rabin all the way until now, and certainly even before, is there have been times when the Israeli government, including people that no one ever expected, like Ariel Sharon, Hawk, very important general in the, in the Israeli army before becoming mm -hmm. prime minister, have removed forcibly settlers from certain places, Gaza and the West Bank and other places like that. And there is, just to give people an understanding, taking even aside the fact that there are those who have a religious perspective on or in, in terms of their Zionism, that this land was promised us by God and in the Torah, etc. It's also turned out that in many cases, there's a feeling of, yeah, we tried that already when we gave them some land and it didn't work. In fact, not only didn't it work, it went really bad, right? And so that is also very much in 2024 on the mind of people. But even in the time of Rabin, as he was talking about doing things like contemplating, he didn't do this. Do we remove whatever that means, the people who are living in Hebron, right? By the way, you can still, well, it's an adventure to go to Hebron today. I've never been there, but I would advise not going there. But you can if you wanted to. Um, as long as you have the bulletproof bus and all the other things along the way, you can go there. But whether it's there or somewhere in the West Bank or in Gaza, when the feeling amongst many, even some who would be considered centrists, are, well, we've tried this and it just hasn't worked. What do you want us to do now? Right? Now, October 7th intensified that even because many of the kibbutzim and moshavim that were attacked were people who were peaceniks and loving, you know, uh, employing those who came from Gaza, et cetera. And now it's very much in, in many ways a united, we got to really figure this out. It was a problem before that we could manage, but now it's one we have to eliminate is something that is definitely on people's minds. So anything that I've talked about or that you, you're thinking about before I go on to the next little section that I wanted to talk about? Yeah, Hebron, Andrew, is, is Hebron not in the West Bank? Hebron is, it's technically, it is, but it's it's one of those places that like is significantly protected by the Israeli government, right? The military is there. There's okay. actually an excellent documentary about it. Um, and the people, look, if you look at from the rabbis, even in the Talmud, there are four holy cities in Israel, okay? Hebron is one of them because of the the, the cave of Machpelah, which is there. Patriarch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it that Hebron perhaps more than, uh, or in its own unique way, of all the places in the West Bank or Gaza Strip, right, it holds a specific importance for those who have the religious Zionist, you know, approach. Right, all the the other three holy cities are in Israel, or currently are currently in Israel. Okay, so yes, Lindy, please. So I have a question. I I was surprised. I read today that they think um, sixty five percent of Israeli Jews do not want a two state solution any longer. For sure. And so, do you think that October seventh caused that much of an increase in that feeling? A hundred percent. I mean, I have friends there who are peace, 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 Nick kind yeah. of people who said not anymore, no more. Like without, I mean, again, without over-dramatizing because this really did happen, not anymore because they set grandma on fire and took my friend and he's in there's, Gaza somewhere. There's a straw Sorry. that broke the camel's back. Yeah, yeah, not anymore. And, you know, that part has become very challenging for people. So now, currently you have it, not, unlike in the book where you had more of a divide between the settlers and those who were not settlers or those who were religious Zionists and those who were not, um, 
you really do have a country that even though the Thursday and Saturday protests have continued against Netanyahu's government, there is a real feeling of we have to eradicate this problem. This is not a let's just go in and deal with it and then try to hope it stays quiet for 10 years kind of thing. This okay. is we have to eradicate. And so that that is clearly also part of a a major problem at the moment. I mean, there's a thousand more complex things, um, you know, that are going on after October 7th. I will say just one quote for, that's in the book from Yigal Amir, which says, my own mortality doesn't matter. It is determined according to the Torah itself. Okay. So he, he is, sorry, my own morality doesn't matter. It's determined from the Torah itself. We have talked about this in other contexts and on other lifelong learning uh, events. But you have to also, we all have to understand that for someone in Yigal Amir's point, from his point of view and his upbringing, what he did was 100% morally correct. It was good. It was right. It was proper. And it's because the Torah told me to, you know, God slash the Torah did it. So there's also an issue when we can look at things of what is good and what is bad, what is moral and what is immoral. And just to understand that people, in this case, um, I don't think any of us would say what he did was moral, but his he would view it as, yes, that is moral. Because if it comes from the Torah, it comes from God. And if it's from God, it must be moral. Okay, And so that part is also a very different, um, in many ways, different than what we see when we talk about whether it's American or around the world assassination type of attempts, right? That's usually for a political reason or some, right? Whatever it happens to be. This was much more akin to things that you would have seen, for example, like in Northern Ireland, right? This was a this was for religious reasons. That's why we did what we did, right? Okay. There's a fascinating book. I actually have it at Share Me. I should have brought it home. Um, called How Soccer Explains the Universe, mm -hmm. okay? So it's an amazing book. It, it has to do with soccer, but it's really about us as people. So for example, in um, Ireland, there's the two biggest soccer teams are Celtic and the Rangers, okay? Those are the two biggest teams. I'm gonna mess this up, but one of them is connected to Catholicism as a team, and one is connected to Protestantism. Mm. So every year when they play, it's the biggest game of the year. And of course, like, Whoever's religion wins, wins for the year, right? And you have these people who are neither, they might be one or the other, Catholic or Protestant, but they support their team, whoever they are. And there are chants like death to the Pope at this game, which has nothing to do with the Pope. But it's a way to like, you know, say we don't like whoever, the team that supports the Catholic side, right? And so you have all of these stories in these books that are, in this book that are totally fascinating, but it parallels a little bit here. This idea that religion and God and the Torah, in this case, are the most important. That's it, the end of the story, right? There's another great story in that book uh, that I was just mentioning about soccer. Um, I think it is in the Netherlands. There is a team that, that called Ajax, it's spelled Ajax, but it's Ajax. And there, I believe it's them, their team, now plays in a neighborhood, their stadium is in a neighborhood where it used to be like the old Jewish neighborhood of whatever city it's in. Their team, like their fans, none of whom are Jewish. They're, I mean, whatever, some small percentage. Their fans are known as the Yid Army. That's their team. And they have the banners and everything. And they're chanting in whatever they're chanting, right? Because they've accepted this as kind of like their, you know, their mantle. And so... One of the things that I just wanted to kind of also really talk about in the book is, um, or I wanted to get your thoughts on it's probably the better way to put it, is do we see any parallels between what happened here and what we're seeing in American politics today or in the American political system? Or is this even 
beyond what we could. Yeah, sorry, Tottenham. Thank you, John. It's in it's in, in um, England. Yeah, and uh, I think it's because the neighborhood used to be the neighborhood where everybody lived. Um, so I just wanted to see if you thought there were any parallels in any way between what we see in American politics today or in American political system and what you, you know, kind of learned about in the book or learned, remember from the story. The You're like, you like ripping off the lid of the Pandora's box, don't you? <laughs> That's okay. No worries. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the answer is absolutely. Uh, the evangelical Christians and the rise of that here in our country, I think, is affecting the politics just like, you know, the Haredi are affecting the politics in Israel, mm -hmm. uh, even in maybe even more so because we have a lot larger population. Um, and I feel that since it's going unchecked, and, uh, you know, after SCOTUS's ruling yesterday, mm -hmm. you know, it's just getting worse when just when you didn't think it'd get worse, it's getting worse. <laughs> you know, I think we're I think Israel can have uh, the rise of civil war within Israel, you know, and I think we could have that here, too. Unfortunately. Yeah. Just my opinion. No, of course. Would anyone else like to share if they think there are parallels, not parallels, whatever you might want to add? I would just agree. I mean, I would agree <laughs> that, that, yeah, that, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously I see the parallels in terms of the, the divide, um, in terms of religion playing a role, um, to me, I would say I'm just, infighting. Uh, the uh, sure. sorry, uh, no, separate, no, separately the whole the whole part about um, uh, Shimon Perez and um, Rabin. I know it's not specifically related, but no, that that, we, that just talking. made me think of that whole uh, situation as well. And actually, how sorry I know this is totally not answering your question, but no, it good. made me think just in terms of comments on it how. Um, the rivalry, um, especially within um, Perez, also was part of what ended the peace process <laughs> because sure, sure. of the decisions that he made that were so um, driven by his own um, uh, self, while well, the rivalry and his emotional sure. issues related to it. Sure. that um you know caused the downfall of peace but um yes I well, would. Yeah, yeah. No, look i think to and me, the press and the involvement of the press in riling upsides yeah sorry right to me there's also a very strong parallel between the red not literally what's being said but the the type of rhetoric mm. that is mm. out there mm -hmm. right that there are people that are evil there's people that are not us there's people that are you know, different and that's bad is something that we see now in politics all the time, right? And for me that, and within the country, in this case of America, right? We're all Americans, but, right? These people are different. These, pe And especially to go back to something we talked about maybe half hour or so ago, the idea of if someone is not of a different background than me, and that could be religiously, that could be in terms of in America, one sexual orientation or color of one's skin or where they came from prior to, you know, where their family history comes, you know, is from all of those things you see playing out here, right? And you see playing out in, you certainly saw playing out in the Rabin, the time of Rabin. The, what I would say that is, very much going is a similar a parallel as you guys mentioned is look Igal Amir in many ways was influenced by his religious leaders okay many of whom were also teaching at the school but religious leaders okay or involved in the school and so I think religious leaders can have an impact especially in certain world parts of our world in America 
that also can cause that to happen. There's an excellent, I've not read it yet, but um, for anyone who is a political, American political kind of person, um, Tim Alberta, who wrote the book uh, American Carnage, just came out with a new book about, he grew up as an evangelical Christian. He's the son of an evangelical pastor. Talked about in America how that has the rise. Of, I forget, it has like a long name, but he just came out with, with that book about how that's occurred. And I think that um, for me, of all the, I mean, obviously I know the story very well, but of all the things that kind of have really, that spoke to me uh, upon rereading the book and the story, re revisiting the story, is that we very much, even people living in cities who have the whole world at their fingertips, who are interacting with others that are of different backgrounds and they see in this case what was on television now with social media going be you know seeing a multitude of um, different perspectives can still very easily be persuaded and be radicalized right and what can happen is there can become severe consequences as a result of that right and in this case, the assassination of, um, one could argue, one of the greatest prime ministers in Israel's history, right? That then set the country in motion in a way that is, since the day it happened, drastically affected Israel's future, okay? I'm not here to say what would have happened or what wouldn't have happened, just like we said with, um, when we met to talk about Shimon Perez, the movie about Shimon Perez a little while back, you don't know what would have happened if you know, a decision was made a little bit differently. But the reality is that what happened with Rabin has totally changed what happened in Israel, whether it's the rise of the Netanyahu's of the world, right? Or to be very honest with you, um, in a, in a non-surprise, and sometimes we see him interviewed on TV, I was living in Israel when Ehud Barak was uh, voted in as prime minister, right? And so sometimes it swings things in a different direction. But one of the things I will tell you that has always struck me, um, many of us know the Shuk in Jerusalem. It's where I used to go to get my groceries when I lived there. And I lived there around the time when Oslo was a thing. Okay, And I will tell you that um, for those, even to this day, although less so now, um, bumper stickers are like a big thing in Israel. Okay, and it, like politically, they would put, you know, it was like getting the little flyers in the mail that you used to get, you know, for your candidate, there would be bumper stickers that you could get everywhere. And the number of stickers, uh, it's the one sticker I don't have that I really wish I did, but the number of stickers that were anti-Oslo, the Oslo Accords, were enormous at the time. It was considered to be in that when you'd go to the market, they'd be everywhere. The guy at the stall, the you know, who owned the grocery cart, whatever you want to call it, was anti-Oslo. It was everywhere. And that was also based on what they were hearing from, who they were hearing it from, whether it was at home or in the synagogue or on the news. And it's just a reminder to us that people can be very easily persuaded. There should be one other issue that I do need to bring up that was in this book, and then we can take some final thoughts that one always has to remember is in the back of the mind or sometimes more in the forefront of the mind of every Israeli. And that is when it comes to the, let's say those living in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, the neighbors, everybody knows somebody who had something horrible happen to them. Mm. And so I'll give you the example that I've given before, um, but I know not everybody has heard this. When we were just in Israel, uh, with when I was just in Israel with the kids last year, we had a third, we had our tour guide, we had our security person, then we had a third young lady who was with us. And her name is Tahir. And when we were at Har Herzl, Mount Herzl, the main military cemetery, she said to me, we were walking in a certain spot. There's a spot where there are, obviously there are graves of those who have been killed in military service. And then there's a wall of people, names, for people who have been killed in terrorist attacks. They're usually buried elsewhere or God forbid, they're never recovered, okay? And she says, you know, points to a name and she goes, 
I want to tell the kids the story about this guy. Okay. I don't ask too many questions in that regard. You're just going to tell the story. So she says, I want you to know that she says who his name is. She goes, I want you guys, to the kids there, to know that this is my cousin who died. Okay. He was killed. And he was killed because he went back to volunteer at his military base after his service to provide meals for the soldiers, to cook, you know, dinner, whatever you want to call it, for the soldiers. And the soldiers were all in the mess hall and they were cooking in the kitchen. And two terrorists snuck in wearing Israeli army uniforms. That's one of the things you see all the time now um, as a tactic. Broke into the kitchen and killed everybody. But in the process of that happening, her cousin and others were able to kind of fend off enough of them before. And they ran away, even though everybody ended up dying afterwards in the kitchen area. But they saved all the soldiers that were in. Like, they never got to the dining hall. So she tells this story, and obviously it's very sad. And she says, I want you to know, you're going to, someday you're going to, or if you don't know it already, you're going to learn about a guy named Gilad Shalit, who was, for many of us who know, a soldier in the Israeli army who was taken hostage. Okay. Now he was returned to Israel in a prisoner exchange for a thousand prisoners. Okay. Now, on the one hand, if you're Gilad Shalit's parents or someone who knows him, you want him to come back at any cost, any cost. And if it was my kid, I would want the same thing to happen. She said, I just want you to know, like, this one was a hard one for my family. Because one of those 1,000 people was one of the, is the guy who killed my cousin, who murdered my cousin, right? What do you say to my aunt, right? And so we read about this, uh, for those who read the book a little bit, there were these kind of ongoing terrorist attacks all along the way. They were kind of back and forth. And there is this real nervous feeling in Israel, even to this day, of the land for peace concept. In the, we're going to return, we're going to get, God willing, they're all alive, 130-something hostages back for 5,000, you know, Palestinian terrorists or whatever, people have been convicted of, you know, crimes. And that's a very difficult thing for people in Israel to accept that because everybody knows somebody, right? And everybody served with somebody. And now you're asking people to believe in a concept that in their mind hasn't followed through before, historically hasn't worked, and or is saying we're going to be returning to or trading, for lack of a better term, to the back to Gaza or back to wherever people live, um, people who have done incredibly horrible things. And that part is very difficult for people. And it becomes a real, it's one of the real struggles, you know, that you, you saw that was being weighed in the book, you know, in many ways, like how do we deal with the ongoing terrorist attacks? And at the same time, want to seek peace between our neighbors, right? Because ultimately, I think that is what Israel wants. Um, that would be my opinion. So any closing thoughts? And then I'm going to just say one last thing at the end. Okay. Uh, yeah, Andrea, please. So just in terms of what you say, you say what Israel wants is you you were saying to seek peace with their neighbors. Yeah, the people but, of Israel want that, yes. But I don't... It, my impression now is that you can't really say that, that it, it sounds more like it's the majority of Israelis want that. Correct. But there are many who don't, many who don't want that. So, want I, yeah, no, I, they don't I, want what having peace means. So, uh, yeah. So, I would say, so here's what I would say I would say that most people, on both sides of the equation, want to live in peace with each other. There are those, both within governments, although I don't know if Hamas is really a government, but within governments and what might be called extremists and their communities, they're not just one person here and there, who actively seek to not have that happen, right? They That's their livelihood to make sure it doesn't happen. And so do I think peace is possible? I would argue at the moment, no. 
But do I think if you took a poll of most people and said, would you like for there to be peace and you can live and they can live and the answer would be yes. But if it, but if having that peace meant giving up any part of what the, any part of the territory that God promised the Jewish people, then you have a, maybe it's 15% or 20% of the Israeli population that doesn't want that. Right. I mean, I would argue it's smaller than that, but even if it's, or, 10, or, okay. yeah. but even if it's 10 or seven, whatever. Okay. Um, yeah, no, I mean, you can never say a hundred percent about anything, but I would say all things being equal, the people, people want there to be peace. Right. They want to live their lives. Right. The problem becomes when you have individuals who, whether it's, well, in many cases, it's for religious reasons, for God wants me to do this reasons, who seek for there not to be peace, then it becomes very problematic. Right. It becomes I, the person in that mindset, I am doing the right thing because I'm doing what God wants me to do what God destined us to do. But I think if you pulled the average, like it, the average, the general Israeli doesn't really want their kid to be in the army. Doesn't really want their kid to be going into Gaza. Doesn't want their husband to be going. They also realize that, you know, there needs to be a way to deal with the people who are coming out or who came over on October 7th and, you know, captured a six month old baby. We got to deal with that. You know, but I mean, I always, I think the gen, this is my belief. The general feeling is the feeling that's been there almost since the beginning of Israel, which is if, um, if um, Israel's neighbors laid down their weapons, there would be peace. And if Israel laid down its weapons, there'd be no Israel, right? It's kind of the general philosophy um, or it's the general thought process. There are, I think most Israelis don't have a positive view of the settlers, if that's the right way to put it. They view them as, you know, like the really problematic uncle you have at whatever Thanksgiving. Like, we don't want them either. But in the meantime, we have to deal with the other bigger problem, which is, you know, my father-in-law over here, who I got to, you know, or my crazy brother, who I got to deal with more so that's what i would say all right well it was wonderful to be with everyone thank you so much we'll stop